Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Lost Caverns of Ixalan limited set review. As always, we've got Yanks on the call, and today is our very first episode, and we're actually going to be going over the introduction to the Lost Caverns of Ixalan. We're going to be talking about returning mechanics, new mechanics that you guys have never seen before, as well as draftable archetypes and a bunch of other fun stuff that you need to know before you start drafting and going to your local pre-releases. So Yanks, are you, tell me, are you excited about Ixalan? Are you a dino uh, pirate merfolk fan? I, I liked Ixalan when it first came out, like Im immediately, but I actually thought the first couple Ixalan sets ended up being pretty underwhelming, especially from limited perspective. So I'm, I'm hoping they've improved on it, although I do like the theme, like the Mesoamerican kind of theme is pretty cool. Yeah, so I did get to play some of these cards already with our pre-con decks. My Commander Show decked out, got to uh, play the early access. So we all played the pre-cons. So there was the dinosaurs, the merfolk, the like conquistadors was like the Orzofi, uh, and then there was the pirates. Um, so overall, a pretty well-rounded group of like fan favorite creature types. So I'm really excited to see what we actually have here in the main set. Yeah, I thought I thought it was interesting last time around, and you kind of saw it with your uh, commander decks too. That you ended up with it's a tribal set, but it's four tribes, not five like you usually get, mm -hmm. um, which I just thought was an interesting twist on a tribal set. Yeah, makes sense. All right, so let's go ahead and kick it off with the start of our introduction. As I frantically thumb through all these tabs trying to find, <laughs> trying to find so my. Spreadsheet. So the fir the the, uh, the start here, uh, the reason we have this clay-fired bricks card up is we're talking about new mechanics coming to the Lost Caverns of Ixalan, and one of them you can see on here is craft. Um, and the way craft works, it's always craft with something. Like in this case, it's with an artifact. What you do is you exile the permanent that has, in this case, the clay-fired bricks. You pay the mana cost associated with it, and then in this case, you also exile another artifact. Now, it can either be one in play or one that's in your graveyard. Um, there are some that it's like exile three of something, and you can mix and match from in play or in your graveyard. It can be any number of those. Uh, then craft resolves, and this comes back into play transformed onto its other side. So crafting from your graveyard seems like the better value if given the choice most of the time, because otherwise you would be, you know, turning two permanents into one. But um, this is an interesting mechanic. It's sort of like bargain, right? Like this does a thing yep. on its own. You don't have to bargain it. But if you have the extra artifact either in play or in your graveyard, you could potentially spend the extra mana mid to late game for a bonus thing, which is the backside, which is uh Cosium kiln um and it just turns into sort of like a lord and when it enters you get it two creatures so that's a pretty strong effect uh if you can come up with the seven mana plus an artifact to exile either from your um control or your graveyard and you'll see that there actually are a fair amount more artifacts because we have pirates and things so we tend to see a lot of treasures but there's also a new map type um uh, token, which is an artifact. You'll see that later in this set review as well. And uh, those will be premium targets for you to exile as well. Overall, Yanks, what do you think of this new mechanic craft? I, I like your comparison to bargain because that's that's pretty much right. You're looking for things that are doing things on ETB or um, so you get the value out of them and then can sacrifice them. You, it's a little different in that you might also be looking for some self mill potentially. Mm -hmm. depending on what color you're in. I, I think it's interesting. It's a it bargains, a good comparison meld, which we only saw on like three cards in Eldritch moon is another one. Um, this could be interesting. It feels a little bit better to me than bargain in a, in the way that you don't have to bargain it at the time. You only get the one opportunity. So if you want to play that spell and you don't have it, you just, you waste that bargain. Whereas this, like you're spending two mana, you're getting a fine ability on its face and it can sit there forever or it can be even used to be crafted with something else, right? If needed, because this by itself is an artifact. So you have the option over time to do both, which to me feels like great value. The biggest downside I see to this is, are the games gonna be going late enough for seven mana and an exile of another permanent to be relevant? Or are these games gonna be too fast? 
Yeah, I'm trying to scan through just quickly the set, and I'm seeing, like, craft for two or four mana sometimes. Um, craft with island is one. Craft with four or more non-lands with activated abilities is an interesting one. Hmm. Um, but so that said, I, I, the backside I, of this seems strong. Yes. Yeah. So I think I think we're going to see a range of craft costs all the way from cheap ones like two mana up to seven. I saw a nine mana one. So I think we're going to hmm. be all over the place on that. All right. Let's go ahead and move on to our new mechanics uh, or the more new mechanics. And this one is going to be a little bit weird. And we ordered these in a way that made the most sense to us, but we will try to walk you through it. So first, we're going to be looking at Descended. So Descended just means that when this, uh, you know, when this is triggered, when your Descended is triggered, if you had a permanent card that was put into your graveyard from anywhere. And now this can be your treasure tokens and your map tokens because those technically hit the graveyard and they are permanents even if they don't stay there. So that should still trigger it, if I'm not mistaken. Correct. Cool. So Descended is just that, right? This is a card that wants to trigger at the beginning of your end step. So each turn you get an additional plus one, plus one counter if you throw something under the bus or sack a treasure. Oh, that's a good point that is being made. Um, those tokens do go to the graveyard and they are permanents, but they are not permanent cards. Do they need to be cards? It does. I didn't realize that until oh. just rereading it right now. It's not if a permanent, it's a permanent card for that exact reason, I'm sure. I didn't read it that way either because nope. I've never really it. seen it say that. Agreed. That is but an that interesting is way that they have tweaked the text to be super specific. When I read that, it just says if a permanent would go to your graveyard, like you know how you skim? Good yeah. Catch. Oh, yeah. Uh, zero wolf. Wonderful catch. Yeah. So the way I read that was just if a permanent went to your graveyard, but that is not the case, actually. So you can't do treasures and maps, which makes this a much harder to trigger each turn. But I'm still fine with it. It's still, you know, you only need to get one trigger of this for it to be a good card, which we'll talk about later in our set reviews. But it seems like a solid ability here. It's going to give you your money's worth. Yeah, I mean, it's going to be very dependent on the car right descended is what you just described but what the reward for descending is will be different on every card so it's an easy enough condition to meet uh, especially because it works on mill it works on discard um so i i i like it it it's, seems like pretty straightforward at least until we see the next ability yeah when i'm looking at the mechanic of a like a new mechanic and i read this card it's a common i kind of give the mechanic the general range or power across yeah. the board, which, you know, obviously some will be weaker, some will be stronger, but more or less, I seem okay with this. Okay, so here's where I get really angry. <laughs> All right, so this is, we're gonna, we're gonna have a rant here, um, which is exactly when a Wizards of the Coast employee is gonna come in and, and see me ranting and then they will hate me forever, but I'm sorry. Okay, so this is an ability called Descend. Not Descended, just Descend. And you can descend four or you can descend eight. And what that means is a lot. <laughs> uh, yeah. I'll let you let you start with this one, Yanks. So, this descend is an ability word. If anybody played back in like Odyssey block where you had threshold, which was a very similar one, that just cared about having seven cards in the graveyard. In this case, descend four or descend eight will care about having four or eight permanent cards in your graveyard. Yes. And that's it. It just it just checks to see if that happens. Now, what happens because of that? In this case, this has flying and it's continuous. Some of them might be when it enters the battlefield, it has a descend ability and checks then only. You know, it all just depends on the, the card itself. But as I'm gonna pass this back to Nergirl here, the uh confusing thing is, well, you've just we've just talked about two abilities with almost identical names. So this is what makes me mad, right? <laughs> so Let's say I play this card and it has descend four and it's active. And then I play the goblin and I move to end step. And the goblin says, if you have descended, do a thing. Well, in my head, I, d I descend because I'm currently doing it. And now I am past tense. I have no, I have descended in this turn because this says descend. It's a grammatic nightmare. I hate this. Yeah. Why it's, Why couldn't we just do Ascend? Like, why can't we just... Well, because Ascend is already an ability. <laughs> well, 
why couldn't we make something else up? I don't know. I I agree. I mean, it's even worse with the the descend cards that are just like triggers on ETB because then at least here it's like you didn't descend. You're just like your thing has descend, but when it just triggers once, yeah, it descended. So you like, play this and you descend four. You you meet the check. You have four permanents, yeah. and then you play the goblin with descended, yeah. and then you move to your end step and you did you descend. You did descended, but you did not descend. Did did did, <laughs> did. Yeah, this descend I, I, did, but you did not descended. So you did. Like I, I get I get the, the, the I get the concept right. It's like your caverns and your try. The, these abilities are related in that it's talking about permanence in the graveyard. So you want to give them similar names, but you you need similar is fine, but they can't be the past tense of the of a verb. Because yes. of exactly what we're talking about here. Because I, I cast this, and I did descend yes. four, which means I descended yeah. this turn. That, that is how grammar works. <laughs> <laughs> this is... I do not complain a ton about mechanics and keywords, and I usually just let live whatever. But this, for some reason, is yeah. the most infuriating thing to me. And... Yeah. Okay. So that is the ability here, guys. Descend four or eight. Just checks to see if you have permanence in your graveyard and it's sort of static. It also means that if I'm not mistaken, they can go away if they remove it or if you yep. return a creature out of your graveyard, you no longer descend four. Correct. Same way that threshold used to work or still works, but isn't a re recent mechanic. So next we're going to uh, go on to the next ability, which is similar vibe with be and similar name because it's called fathomless descent yeah fathomless descent is is basically the same as what we just saw for descend four or eight except there's no I hate using this word because it's an ability but there's no threshold number to hit it's just something that gets more powerful depending on number of permanents so in this case in your graveyard so it's checking the same thing but it's just it's going to be like an x effect Yes, so it is checking, the enchant gets minus X, minus O, where X is the number of permanent cards in your graveyard. So Descend 4 or 8 needs those amounts to be active. Fathomless Descent is, like uh, Yank said, just a straight X count. Um, sort of like the spells that say, you know, um, create an elemental, it is, its power and toughness are equal to the number of spells in your graveyard. It just checks whether that's 1 or 2 or 12, it does not matter, and it will do the thing for that turn. Exactly. Like descend. The biggest difference is a card like this. If you have three permanents in your graveyard, you get something. Yeah. If you get four, you get more. But if it's a descent four card, it goes from getting nothing to getting everything. Well, um, I mean, descend four. I haven't seen the rest of the set, but in this last card's case, at least when you hit four, it does activate. So it's not nothing. No. I, yeah. I mean, as long as it's at three, it's nothing. Yeah. Unlike yeah. this one, where they are one-time abilities, you actually get nothing <laughs> if if there were no no permanents in the graveyard. Yeah, although this is right in an enchantment, so it's it's continuous as well. I I assume there's probably some fathomless descent, be. like maybe removal spells or probably. something. I can see probably. Yeah, you're probably right on that. Uh, but maybe there wouldn't be. Maybe they're all stuck on enchantments and creatures, and yeah. that'd be fine. Um, well, we shall see. So yeah complicated grouping of things. We have descended, which is not the past tense version of descend four or eight. And you also have fathomless descent. Um, all things that check your graveyard and ensure that you either have cards, permanents in your graveyard or have Yay, had a permanent card runs. go to your graveyard. Queen of so just play mushrooms. Relic of Progenitus, Exile, Graveyards, and don't worry about it. So let's go on and we will stop um, <laughs> huffing about the that those because I could go on all day, and now we've got um what I believe is the last new mechanic, which there's already quite a few, which I'm kind of impressed that we have so many. Uh, now we've got discover, and the card that we're gonna take a look at is daring discovery, and it has discover four exile cards from the top of your library until you exile a non land card with mana value four or less. Cast it without paying its mana cost or put it into your hand. Put the rest onto the bottom in a random order. 
So Discover is interesting, right? Because it feels a little cascady, but it isn't. Yeah. Um, it, it basically is, except I guess you don't have, it doesn't stay exiled if you don't cast it. I mean, it doesn't check the mana cost either. It's, it's whatever the number is on there, but. Yeah. And another way that we saw this come into play was like during our early access uh, commander game, there is a dinosaur that says when a card comes into play, you discover based on the creature's toughness. So oh, unlike sure. Cascade, yeah. where you the, the ability happens when the card is on the stack, this is happening when the card is actually already in play. So let's yep. say you cast, Cascade into a board clear. Mm -hmm. If you discover into a board clear, you would kill your own creature in that scenario. Whereas if you had gotten it off of a Cascade creature, you would not have killed your own creature, right? Yes, although that, that would, I mean, not for um, rats, but for spells like the one we see on the screen, right? It's still happening on the stack. Yes, because this one is a sorcery. That's yeah. what this yeah. is doing, is resolving it. Yeah. But but the ability discover can be on creatures and True. resolve in different ways than Cascade Agreed. does. Yep, yep. Um, um, I liked calling the dinosaur one. It was a booty Cascade, like, <laughs> which just seems like a pretty great uh, mechanic name. Yeah, um, I believe discover should work the exact same way as Cascade when it comes to mana values. So, like, weird things like with double face cards should work the same as they do with current Cascade rules. Hmm. Um, one thing I know that is a little weird with Discover, although, again, this is not particularly a, a, a limited thing, but is Adventure Cards. Um, it checks the casting cost in the top right of the, the card, like it normally would, but then you can play either half as long as either half meets the mana value requirement. Oh, that's interesting. So, like, um... I mean, for, for adventure cards, that makes sense, because it's just an alternate casting cost. Yeah. Um, so, like, the so, example I know they give in the article uh, was, like, if you have Discover 3 and Exile Picnic Runer, which is a one in a red card, but a 3G adventure, um, you can't cast the adventure because it costs 4, but if that had cost 2 and a G, then you could. So... It checks the actual mana cost of the card, though, and then it allows you to still cast it for the adventure side. But if you, if the creature, if the adventure creature is more expensive than the discover number, it wouldn't work, right? Yeah, if the adventure creature is more, it wouldn't, wouldn't, it would, you would keep going till the next card. When but you if discover. the adventure one is cheaper, you can't choose to cast it for that. No, you can choose to cast the adventure side if it's cheaper. But what I'm. But what I'm saying is, is if the creature is higher... Oh, it's too it, much. It's too much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It will yep. disqualify the cheaper adventure Correct. from being cast. Correct. Yeah. It, it only comes up... This is really only comes up if you have a creature that costs less, and but the adventure costs more. Then it gets weird. <laughs> yeah. Does that... And then does can you cast that? You can't cast the adventure then. Okay. It's interesting that the... The cost of the creature allows you to cast the adventure though it is so long as it, so it's like two checks yeah huh. but you would think that then the the cost of the creature would not matter and it would not check that it would check it would allow you to cast it for the alternate casting cost that's interesting hmm. yeah i understand why the the creature cost matters because it's exile and non-land card not mm -hmm. spell but i don't I, i'm not 100 percent sure why you couldn't just cast any cost adventure other than they decided that way because they don't want old Cascade shenanigans going on. Yeah. Is probably why. So they it's just put that, it's up, interesting. put that up front. <laughs> like, it feels to me that they would kind of pick one or the other, but both is fine. Yeah. That's cool. That's a cool, uh, interesting thing that we probably won't see come up much. No. Um, okay, so that is the last of our new mechanics. So we're going to jump into our returning mechanics. This is the segment that is dedicated for those of you guys who don't play a lot of limited or are newish to magic and maybe don't know some of these older mechanics that come back from time to time, but are, you know, well established in, in magic. And the first one we wanted to make note of is Battle Cry. So Battle Cry, I believe it's only like this card and it wasn't even listed in the actual 
notes of the set. So I'm not really sure how it snuck in, but it's a cool mechanic. And I thought it was worth mentioning. It says whenever this creature attacks, each other attacking creature gets plus one plus O until end of turn. So it's a pretty cool mechanic. Great for going wide. White likes to do that. Vampires will do that. So overall, a very aggressive mechanic that we're seeing come back here into the Lost Caverns. Yeah, I mean, this is the for in a standard set. This is the first time we've seen Battlecry in 12 years. Um, since Mirrodin Besiege. Now it showed up in Modern Horizons uh, and it showed up in one of the unsets. But um, yeah, so yeah, I think people that had do play a lot, it's good to bring this up because you know, hey, I wasn't playing during that set. It was so long ago. <laughs> yeah. So I don't think you guys will see it much. This is a rare and I don't think it's on anything else in the set, but be aware that it is a thing. Um, next up, we've got Flashback. Again, I don't think there's a ton of these and it is more common than Battlecry, I think. So you, you, yeah. most of you are probably familiar with it. Flashback is just a way for you to cast this card an additional time by paying oftentimes more mana um, or, you know, some other sort of additional cost like discarding cards or something along those lines. Um, so you get double the value for the card. And usually that is because the rate for the card is not great. So you're sort of splitting the card ac across two casts. Yeah, this is interesting because like you said, it usually costs more mana to flashback. This one, for example, costs less, which I think is probably a nod to the, there's some self mill in this set um, with all the descend stuff going on. It's probably a nod to that sort of effect that you can just mill this in and still have a spell to cast. Well, also six is a little high, I think, for this ability because it is creature sure. you control for six at sorcery speed. Sure. Yeah. It's, it's not a banger of a card on its face. So it probably yeah. just averages out. I feel like this ability probably should cost five. So these two things together also equals five, which makes it fine. Yeah. Um, all right. So flashback, battle cry. And now we also have... I don't remember what this one was. Oh, transforming cards. This is a, oh, look at the cute little mushrooms. I didn't see those before. They're having a little <laughs> seance. Oh, adorable. Okay, so transforming cards, again, something we're seeing more and more, but we wanted to make sure we noted them because they look a little like modal lands and modal cards where you can cast them on either side. These ones are not quite like that. They usually get cast for one side and then have to meet some sort of requirement for you to then flip them and transform them. So this one says control four or more creatures. You transform it. So it will flip into this, which turns it into a land and it does a thing. It's important to note when you transform something, it does not leave the battlefield. So um, for creatures that are transforming, if they have like, you know, some sort of aura on them that won't fall off because you're just staying in play. You're just transforming into something else. Yeah, if if you were tapped when you transform, you stay tapped. If you are untapped, you stay untapped. All that stuff stays the same. It's important to note in this set because craft cards also look pretty similar as transforming cards, but those specifically exile and come back. So those do it. ETB, leave the battlefield and enter the battlefield. And we have had a couple other things that do that as well, where you pay the cost and they will flicker themselves essentially and then re-come into play. This one is a little bit different. We've seen a, a cycle of these like enchantment lands in previous ones. My favorite is the one that makes vampires, uh, Legion's Landing. Legion's so this Landing, is yeah. a new cycle of sort of Legion Landing-esque cards. Um, yeah. Okay. One more thing? No, I say, yeah, I th think, I don't know, I don't believe they reprinted Legion's Landing, unfortunately, but I think that one might have been reprinted uh, at Lamach because it's a commander staple. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, moving on, we've got Explore. This is a mechanic that we've only seen once or twice. I think it came up in some, like, arena-only cards as well, but Explore is a pretty cool ability that allows you to flip the top card of your library, look at it. If it's a land, you can put it into your hand. If it is a not land, you get a plus one, plus one counter. So allows you to sort of get some extra card advantage and, or if you don't, it, you know, gets a bonus. So this ends up being like either draw a land for free. It's a one, one for one, which is pretty good. Or it's a one mana two, two. So also bear on steroids. So 
solid card that has some flexibility. It doesn't always do what you want it to do when you want it to do it. Like if you have plenty of lands late game, you're just like, I hope this is a two, two, but, um, but at least you don't have to draw your land. Yeah. The next next turn. (laughs) So it just depends, right? Like what you are going to get with these are varied, but there's also a quite a bit of synergy that's based around exploring. At least there was in the last set. Yeah, um, I mean, right, so this is an original Ixalan mechanic. Uh, Ixalan, we're rivals of Ixalan. I think it's been used in some of Universes Beyond stuff. Like, I think there was a card in the Doctor Who set that had Explore. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's, it's all got, throughout the new Merfolk. The new Merfolk uh, Commander deck all explores. Yep. So you, I, I expect to see a lot of this throughout this set. It, it also has some nice synergy with the descend trio of abilities because you when you don't hit a land you get to have the choice of putting a card in your graveyard which could be a permanent for descend helps you with that that that's 100 percent true that's a nice way of of getting some extra stuff into your yard okay next up we have a new token not a new mechanic but a new token which still sell, felt like a similar vibe so we're going to take a look at the cartographer's companion Uh, When it enters the battlefield, you create a map token, which is not a thing we've seen in the past, which means I need to make more hammy tokens. But (laughs) you get to put in a actual physical cardboard map that allows you to pay one, tap, sacrifice it. Target creature you control explores, activate only as a sorcery. So either get a free land draw or a plus one plus one counter from this. So not super valuable. It's like it's no clue. No. It's not a clue, but it's, it's filling in this that role of, you know, the new sort of token artifacts they've been producing between clues and food and treasure and blood and now map token power stones like they kind of may, might we might see repeatedly. Yeah. Um, and I like one, that because you can put it into your graveyard so it works out to be equivalent to a blood kind of like you are going through one additional card, which is nice. And I think people really underestimated blood tokens. So I think this map will be really strong. I think the map will be strong. One thing to note is just like uh, a lot of spells, right? This does target a creature at sorcery speed. So if they kill the source, kill the creature, this will just fizzle. Mm. Yeah. I wish you could. I wish it said up to one creep up to one target creature explores. But yeah, the creature has to be there to explore, I guess. So I guess it makes to sense. Get the counter, yeah. Flavor-wise, you can't have no creatures going on an adventure. That doesn't make sense. So I still think it'll be strong, but yeah. um, I'm excited to make a new hammy map token. Oh, hopefully not with this art, because then he would have to just be the skull, and that's depressing. Well, he'll be like a little adventurer, like an Indiana Jones theme where he's got a map. The hat? The hat and the yeah. whip? Yeah! All right, I got a, I got a message, uh, <laughs> Andre. Um, okay. Final one, which is finality counters. Uh, we're going to take a look at the soul coil viper, uh, sacrifice soul coil viper, return target creature card from your graveyard to the battlefield with a finality counter on it. Activate as a sorcery. If a creature with a finality counter would die, exile it instead. So this is an ability that has always been around. The only difference is, is it was never really keyworded. So we've seen a lot of creatures, And you'll play a lot of them in Commander that say, you know, return target creature card from your graveyard. If it were to die, it goes to the exile instead. Um, It was hard to remember those. Now we've got sort of counters that can represent them. Yeah, this is just a tracking um, device for for this sort of ability. Um, Like poison counters and stuff like that we never had before either. And I don't really see any way that this can interact with anything that matters. I guess if there are ways to remove the finality counter would be nice, but it doesn't like proliferate doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how you could have six of them. They do the same thing. Um, but this removing, does specify have, dies. So if you were to bounce the creature, you would be able to cheat death. Yes, which was true on some of the old abilities and some not. Some of them were like if it would go to any zone. Or like leave the zone, battlefield. Or leave the battlefield. Some of them you could get away with bouncing. Um, or doing stuff like Obsidat, where it self-exiles and comes back. Um, but, uh, yeah, I guess the biggest difference really would be the the fact that if you have a way to remove the finality counter. 
Yeah, which most likely I think the easiest way to do that would be through a bounce. Um, but I'm sure there are ways to remove counters that are silly, but not going to be in limited. So not yeah. going to worry about it. Um, okay, now that should be the end of our new and returning mechanics. So let's go ahead and jump into the draftable archetypes that you guys will be playing uh, here in the next few weeks. So starting off with the Azorius, this is the only non-creature one, and that's because it represents artifact control. So you're going to have a lot of artifacts and you're going to have a slow paced card draw counterspell type game. Yeah, uh, this is going to rely on craft to some degree. Even this is, you know, it's not a creature, but it, it makes a creature. Uh, so it's, it's not, you know, pure, you know, draw go control. But yeah, I mean, this is, we've, we've seen this sort of as uh, artifact style deck in white, blue, and like original Modern Masters. Um, I mean, that was a little more tempo y than control, but it was another sort of artifact theme. I do remember seeing a lot of um, craft and a lot of um, descend four and eight in blue. So I would expect to see a lot of those new mechanics in this archetype. Yeah, I think white has some explore, but not a lot. So I think you're right. I think this is going to focus on craft and descend. Okay, so this one has a flip side. Again, we'll get a, we'll get to that when we do the ratings as well. But we wanted to just do a brief overview of the archetypes. Next up, we have the Demir colors. Um, this is going to be descend control, so it's going to focus a lot on what you have in your graveyard. So it's going to be a little bit of self mill. It's going to want you to have permanence actually in your graveyard. Yeah, this is another controlling deck, as you can see by something like descend eight is not something you're going to get too quickly, even with uh, some sort of self mill. But it's going to be one of those that's slow but powerful. Yeah. Now. Yeah, Descend 8. This this particular one, it's an ability that you can activate when you have Descend 8, so you actually can use it, you know, later. It is not dependent upon yep. you needing to have 8 permanents in the graveyard at 5 mana. So don't let that deter you when playing these things. Yep, and, and it counts itself because it's in the graveyard when you have that ability, so... Oh yeah, I was going to... I was going to try to say these things because it's really funny. So Master's Guide Mural. Hey, hey, hey. These are the signpost cards, guys. Um, Uch Benbach, the great mistake. Just like Every me. time I hear that, I think of the song like The Great Escape. Playing well, in do, my head for some how reason. How would you say this card? Uh, Uch Benbach. Uch Pretty close ben to what you did. All right, all right. I'll take that. Now we have Zoyoa, Lava Tongue. Yeah. Sweet. All right, so now we have the Rakdos um, sort of signpost here, and this is going to be Descending Beatdown. So we are interested in having permanents go to the graveyard, either by sacrificing or having them in combat. This has Death Touch, so it's a great thing to activate for your other Descends. But also at the beginning of your end step, if you descended this turn, each opponent may discard a card or sacrifice a permanent, uh, and then it will deal three damage to each opponent who did not. So great little way to punish your opponents for doing some fun stuff, uh, or you get to do some fun stuff and punish your opponents. Yeah, Rakdos often has some sort of sacrifice theme to it, which fits very nicely with the descending uh, type deck, especially an aggressive one. Also, Rakdos also just wants to get in and be aggressive, have little black death touchers, tr make trades, play these things post-combat, and get value. Yep. So don't be afraid to get in and box. Uh, next up, we've got the uh, Gruul, and this is going to be dino-themed, and it is going to focus on just stompy dinosaurs, which is normal for the Ixalan sets. And we've got the signpost card is... It's Quinth. Yep, it's Quinth. It's Quinth, firstborn of Gishath. That is a very baby Gishath. I, I don't remember. How big is Gishath? Is, he's, oh, I'm thinking Galt is a 12-12. Gishath is a... I don't know. It's a 7-6. Uh, 
I mean, that looks, if this is a 2 3, that just, and those are the feet, that looks a lot bigger than a 7 6. Yeah. Well, I mean, maybe maybe it doesn't, you know, maybe it doesn't scale right, right? Like little chompers, they chomp. It's true. And I guess there are all sorts of dinos that might be big feet, but like small torso. Yeah. He's got little arms. Anyway. He's got very little arms. We uh we get distracted. It's late. We're tired. <laughs> Sorry. So we'll go over the set reviews, but make sure you're drafting stompy stuff if you're looking to be in these colors. Let's talk about green white. This is buff aggro. So you're gonna be doing some counters, you're gonna add some fun stuff, and we're gonna be looking at Kutzil Malamet Exemplar. Yep, very good. Yeah, green white. I, I've seen some cards during spoiler season. A lot of it is you know, they're calling it buff aggro, but it's this this clause of having your creatures have power greater than their base power, is basically. So it's not specifically counters or auras, it's just anything that's increasing your power or toughness in some cases. Yeah, so it could be, you know, counters, lords, whatever. But, I mean, Selesnia, right? Selesnia gets yep. buff. You go wide, yep. you get buff. So not not surprised to see this archetype. It's not, like, particularly unique. Okay, now we've got the white black. We've got the sacrifice theme, and we're looking at Bartolome del Presidio. Presidio, no T in there, but otherwise, sure. You're good. <laughs> uh, this is going to be your sacrifice vampire cleric y vibe, and uh, I, I'm here for it. This is going to make a lot. I, I need I need all these cards for my commander decks for sure. Um, sacrifice is another creature or artifact, put a plus one plus one counter on it. So you're getting some benefit for sacrificing. Black wants to do a lot of those um, descended past tense. So you want yep. cards to be hitting into your graveyard, which will allow you to get so much value, right? Like this guy already gets a counter for your sacrificing of your one one or whatever. But then on top of that, you're gonna get more value from the rest of your build. So pretty excited to see how this one plays out. Yeah, and you're starting to see some of the overlaps, right? We saw black red wants things to descend. So the black side, you've got sacrificing things. White blue is artifact control. The white portion, and also you can sacrifice artifacts. So you're starting to see how some of the the color pairs overlap. All right. Next up, we've got the blue red, and this is typically going to be your sort of like um, spellsy, but we're focusing a little bit more here on like pirates and some Arr. artifacts. <laughs> How does that go again? Ark. Ark. <laughs> <laughs> what is a, a pirate's favorite letter? R. You would think it's R, but it's actually the C. C. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's interesting, right? Like most of the time, is it focuses on spells, and that has been the case in the last few limited sets. But here, it's going to be a little bit more piratey. So you're looking at more at creatures, you're looking more at artifacts, probably more for treasures, and map tokens is going to be super dope for your pirates. Um, interested, this is one of the ones I feel like is breaking the mold. Most of the other archetypes have been pretty straightforward. This one I think is going to be a little bit unique to our typical draft format. Yeah, definitely different than your normal is it deck. Somewhat similar to what we saw, is it uh, last time we were in Ixalan? Wasn't as artifact focused, but it was pirate focused. So, uh, you know, a little bit different, but more in that vein than in the last few sets. All right, moving on to Golgari. I love a fungus. <laughs> I'm a big slime foot fan. So we have a sort of descended, grindy, sapperling slimy format for for this i'm guessing you want to do a lot of stuff with your graveyard because you have descend eight so you want permanence in your graveyard that could be self mill that could be like you know dumping a bunch of stuff and then recurring it i think this will be an interesting archetype looking at what we have here with a multiple descend character i mean why, why did everybody enjoy being around dakawali dakawali what's that well, that's the, the card name here, Akawali. Oh, Akawali. I don't know. He's a really fun guy. Oh my god, Yanks. <laughs> Go home. All right, that's it, folks. Goodbye. 
<laughs> See you in the next video. Yanks won't be there. <laughs> You're the worst. <laughs> All right. Um, what do you think of this archetype? Black green in the last few sets have just not had like a really good identity. And I think we might actually have one here. It seems pretty focused on these, you know, large descend numbers. Yeah, I like it. Um, and now we've got Boros. So this is going to be the tapping mid range, which is an interesting way to describe a sort of Boros archetype. So this might be a little bit unique as well. Uh, this particular creature, this is your signpost. When it attacks, you may tap up to two untapped artifacts that you control. If you do, discover three. So it's going to give you access to treasure and map tokens. It's gonna give you something to use those resources for in addition. And then cat discover is, we talked about like sort of a cascade-ish ability. So you'll get free cards off of this as well, which could be really helpful to an aggressive Boros deck that needs to keep cards going and keep your, their hand full. Yeah, and scrolling through, you've got some cards that like are cheaper or do more damage if they target tapped creatures. So you have some tappers in the set as well. So it's it's a definitely a different twist on Boros. Normally you're tack, tapping just to attack, but here you're tapping for other reasons. Yeah. Incentivizes you to to get, you know, maybe you don't care about trading or getting your tutu eaten because you know that, you know, you'll likely get something replaced. For sure. All right. Uh, moving on, almost done. Now we've got the um, green, blue, the Sultai, I'm no, sorry, the Simic deck, not quite Sultai, uh, but we've got the Explorer mid-range merfolk. We tend to see a lot of like ramp and big idiots and, Sultai in general does tend to be pretty mid-rangey, and I think Merfolk also um, tend to start to snowball in that mid to late game. So I'm not not surprised to see that here as an archetype. No, you had a lot of the Merfolk in original Ixalan explored, and uh, not surprised to see that that continues here around uh, Nikanzil. Oh, I was gonna say it. Yeah, Nikanzil current conductor. I forgot. I think I forgot some. Kapar. Kaparakti, Sunborn, and Akawali. All right, close enough. I suck at saying card names. So, Yanks, between... I think I know the answer to this, but what is the archetype you are the most excited to see in action? For what I most want to play, it's probably Demir. But okay. I'm actually curious to see how the Boros one comes out because it's so different than normal. All right. The one I'm the most excited to play per always is Orzoff. And this is more Orzoff for me than most in Limited. Um, I really like the Vampire Clerics. I've always been a huge fan of when those are in a set. So I'm super excited to see that and how that plays out. But I don't... Orzoff always ends up being a little, like, underwhelming. Um... So the one I'm probably the most excited to see as far as like what I think will be very powerful. I think it's going to be. I I'm kind of excited for this, this Rakdos. I feel like this yeah. is a really cool mechanic. And if done right, can if done right and drafted well, can be an absolute amazing deck. Yeah, and I will say, I know you said Orzhov tends to be a little underwhelming, but uh, last time we were in Ixalan, Orzhov Vampires is one of the best decks in the format, so. Um, I, I keep getting tricked. I feel like the last, few, like, I don't know, probably the last, like, five sets, I would say, two or three of them, I was like, oh, Orzhov looks so good, and then I draft it, and I feel strong, and then it's always yeah. just medium performance. No, I hear you. I just, I, I remember it being good last time. Um, so, you know, if, they, if they're designing... In a similar way, then uh, maybe you'll get a good Orzov deck again. Fingers crossed. All right. So that's the end of our introduction to the Lost Caverns of Ixalan. We will be doing the full set review. This one was a little bit on the long side, but make sure you guys tune in. We will be posting each of the colors as well as colorless, multicolor, and like, is there another one? No, there's no wrap up. So yeah, check those out. Yanks will be on the call. We'll be rating every single card from one to five based on its playability in the average sealed or draft. So 
Thanks again, guys. Let us know in the comments down below if you are excited for the new Ixalan and let us know which of the draftable archetypes you think will be the strongest. Thanks for watching, guys. See you next time.